Good evening, everyone. As we'd like to be patient with the screen, that will come back and the presentation will come up. We would like to ask for our dear creator to be with us throughout this talk and throughout the moments that we we try to analyze um, this topic not only here but in our lives as well as we continue on in this beautiful march that we have together asked for and dived into because it's always good to re remind ourselves that we are not physical beings that we are spiritual beings in this um, e beautiful experience in the corporeal life right this beautiful body that we have this reincarnation um, that we have asked for as we said it but we are spiritual beings we are spiritual beings under the guidance of the first cause of all things right the the supreme intelligence of the universe and we say this with intention and we in the, before we bring anything that perhaps will help us develop the understanding on this matter heaven and hell and we'll talk a little bit about purgatory as well it's nothing really to, for us to be alarmed um like we sometimes can be when we're, talk we're talking about hell, talking about heaven, or talking about suffering. It's there. It's in front of us. We should acknowledge and we should um, analyze it, but with a different perspective. We're definitely with a different perspective um, um, in this, let's say, as Kirsten remind us, since we are in this, in this um, transitional uh, moment of our lives in this planet as well, in this transition moment, we need to gather new lo a new luggage or or new understandings for us to take to the next step that will come um, in the near future. But he will, here's what we would like to do before we do anything, um, we talk about anything, um, and it's to help one another. Um, and this can be a moment of analysis um, that we ask everyone to share if you want to obviously those who are following us on the web what is your understanding about let's start with hell what is your understanding about hell suffering okay is have you been to hell what hellish moments okay how is it not good right it's okay to say it. It's 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 perfectly fine. Um, we there, there in in behind any any thought any feeling. Uh, sometimes we you know we try to hide ourselves and you know oh I don't want to say this I don't want to, but quite frankly sometimes our lives can be very harsh right and we are suffering and people don't understand because they're not going through. But when I go through then things are much different and then I cry and do that. But when somebody else is going through. That's not hell. That's not difficult at all, right? That's a piece of cake. That's heaven <laughs> compared to what I go through, right? But hell is that moment, you know, that we are going through, that difficult situation that we're facing. That demon perhaps can be that individual, difficult individual that is right next to us, and we're talking to them. We're trying to get an acknowledgement what also who we are, human beings, and they don't acknowledge and we see this not only in our lives, but in the masses, different uh, religions, different uh, sects. And it's quite frankly our reality. It's just our reality. Um, there are also variations on how we want to paint this world or, or this hell and how, how much emphasis we give to it, right? Thus making us suffering more. But it's there. The suffering is there and should be acknowledged. What about heaven? Peace of mind. What else? What is heaven? Hmm? Give me an example. Something that happens in our lives, perhaps, or when everything goes fine. Peace, right? Do we have peace in our lives? Sometimes, okay. Do we have um, um, happiness in our lives at all? Right. The same way we, you know, it, it's interesting because if we analyze this idea, the same way when we see, for example, a mother at birth, right, for someone who denies hell, oh, there's no hell, there's no such a thing. 
Well, the mother's giving birth. <laughs> I've never been through it, thank God. <laughs> Maybe, you know, next reincarnations, but it's hell. For that person, it's hell. However, then becomes heaven. Well, the pain, the pain, related to the pain. Oh, you see, she, she's already, Dion is already saying, oh, it's not that bad. I mastered. Okay, well, for you, <laughs> for what I was, I was able to see or, you know, see all the time, it is, it is pretty hard. But it's interesting that you brought this point because for some mothers, it's okay. They don't feel as, as, as much. But for some, it can be quite excruciating, right? And as, as we were saying, but when the baby comes and the mother is able to receive that beautiful thing, that pain, where is it? Gone. Completely gone. What about purgatory? Since we're talking about this, what about the purgatory? Where is, where is it? It's in between. It's the guilty moment, okay? Indecision, okay? The limbo, okay? Good point, good point, all right? So is it in a specific place? Can we go to that place if we want to? If I say, okay, where's purgatory? Show, me to, show it to me now. Hmm? It's something that from our minds, okay? All right, so this is, these are things that... It really helps us because when we, when we, any study that we do, anything that we do, especially something that will free our minds, free our hearts from what we have learned in the past, if we do this in these analysis, same thing when we talk about death, what's going to happen to me? One of the angels says all the time, think about it because we are spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings. So it's important for us to really analyze these things. There's nothing wrong to it. And if we feel ashamed because we have done something wrong, then we... We're going to go back and we're going to learn here what to do next. If we still, you know, under the mentality, oh, my God, there is a hell and I'm going to go there because I have done something wrong. We'll see. We'll talk about it. But it's interesting that we do this. An example uh, that I'd like to share with everyone. Um, about a year, year and a half ago, I was actually um, talking to this young lady. And, it, it was, you know, since my work involves getting to know the person and getting to know what they do, I asked what she does, and she, well, I believe she's still doing, hopefully, um, and she was serving the army. And she was actually stationed in Afghanistan. <coughs> Excuse me. And obviously the conversation developed, and when I asked her, so what do you think? She's like, this now is hell for me. I'm like, what are you talking about? This being sitting here with me, this is hell? And she's like, yeah, I want to go back. I was like, come again? I want to go back. And uh, she started explaining herself because she really felt that I was, you know, well, what is she talking about? She said, that is the only place where I truly learn the true meaning of brotherhood. And I want to go back because here, to me, right now I'm not doing anything. It's not me. I can't relate to you. I can't relate to other people. And I was like, wow. And she was calling the civilian life or, you know, that she was able to, um, um, you know, to live, you know, for the hours. And she was about to actually to be sent back again because she asked to go back and, and serve again. Um, to her, it was hell. But being in war, it was, and then she developed, a, you know, the, the, develop, the conversation developed where she was talking about, you know, all the things that was going on and all, this, all the opportunity that she had to, to help other people who was there, not only the other mili mili um, um, military friends, but also um, people in Afghanistan as well. The families who were suffering, all those things. To her, that was happening. To her, that was her true reality. And I was just like, wow. And, you know, it makes us wonder, you know, where is heaven? Where is hell? Right? And all these things that, that really bugs our, our mind sometimes. And in the midst of trying to understand this a little bit, of course, we can add, we can extend this, this, this conversation to many, many hours because we have what we'll, you know, we're we'll bringing inside with us as well as some, some understanding um, of, this, of this life. But we want to kind of like just go through little by little and we will try to, um, to analyze, you know, what we see on the dictionary, which obviously it's, you know, a good... Uh, Pulse check, you know, in order for us to understand what is out there now, to under, uh, as far as the understanding of hell, heaven, and purgatory as well, since we're going to add that third piece in there. So, in the dictionary.com, 
we can see that hell is the place or state of punishment of wicked after death, the abode of evil and condemned spirits, the Gina or the Tartarus, any place or state of torment or misery. They made their father's life a hell on earth, just an example. Something that causes torment or misery, having that cuts stitched without anesthesia was hell. So again, we are always associating the, the pain, the difficult moments um, with hell. The powers of evil, the abode of the dead, uh, show or the hades, um, these are, I believe, so if I'm not mistaken, you know, gods of, of hell. Um, but just for us, again, it's a pulse check for us to understand where we are. Because if we are looking on the internet and we'll see a bunch of things, but this, again, this is just a, a basic explanation. And it, it goes along with what we are we just mentioned, as well as um, what we're feeling, the state of mind. Thank you, Yasko. And, and what we will see. What we see. In the spirits book, we'll then make a parallel with the spirits book. We see on question uh, 1012, we try to minimize as much as possible the, 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 the text that we bought, but it's pertinent to, you know, for us to analyze the whole, um, the whole um, question as well as the answer. Is there a circumscribed place in the universe that is intended for the punishment, punishments and pleasures of spirit according to their merits? Let's analyze this. The answer is, again, the spirit's saying, we have already answered this to you guys. So let me go back again and, and, and paraphrase, you know, thinking the way the spirits were probably thinking at the time, very wisely and kind. Punishments and joys are inherent to the degree of a spirit's purification. Each spirit carries within itself the source of its own happiness or unhappiness. And since spirits are everywhere, there is no circumscribed or enclosed place for one or the other. As for incarnate spirits, the degree of their happiness or unhappiness depends on the evolution of the world they inhabit. So it's, it depends, everything depends on our perception. Everything depends on our uh, degree of advancement, as far in, in, in morally speaking, m uh, mostly, as well intellectually. Because since we bring this idea of what? Grading ourselves well developed morally and, and intellectually, and really hovering these two planes of evolution, if we were to go back 50 years ago, right? Where's the iPhone? Where's the iPad? Where's the computer? It would be hell. Try to do your job today, your work today, or function as we function today without a computer. That is hell, right? Now, if we think, if we think morally as well, the same thing. All the laws, all the changes that we have been through, because we all, we all have made what? Advancements. We have stopped, think about it, and say, okay, you know what? No more. We need to change. So we see here that there is no circumscribed place place. There is no um, area um, that we can say, okay, that is hell, this is heaven. But the question still stays, right? Stands. If you go to a slum, for example, where people, you know, poverty rings, right? It's there. It's visual. How do you feel? Can we call that a really bad place that you feel like there is hell? Why? Did God create that? Did God create the, the disorders of our lives? The little hells of our lives? No. Again, there's something that needs to be done. There's something that needs to be um, worked on in order for us to really get out of that situation. It makes a, us wonder. Because the, we may, we may, the, the spirits are telling us there is no exactly place that you can go and, and, it, there, and there is hell, there is heaven, or purgatory but it's really um, our perception. But we can, still, we can still see it. We can still see it. We move on then to heaven. And the same, the dictionary.com, we find the abode of God, the angels, and the spirits of the righteous after death, the place or state of existence of the blessed after the moral life. This show, um, capital letter, just like you kept it, often heavens the celestial powers, God, um, the met metonin uh, for God, for heaven's sake, just examples that are given as well on the dictionary.com. 
um, the a, wo a, a wooden roof or canopy over the outer stage of Elizabeth Theater, usually heavens, uh, the sky, uh, firmament, or expense uh, of space surrounding the so surrounding the earth. Anything that is above, we always try to. You know, we we brought the picture not to make any give second ideas or second thoughts about it, but this is we always you know think of of heaven being below, um, hell being below, and heaven being above, right? Up in the sky, whatever circumscribe us, as we have gathered from different religions, from different understandings uh, that we learn in our lives. But comes Spiritism in question ten sixteen, when Kardec asked. In what sense should we word heaven to be, should the word heaven be understood? And then the spirits start asking questions and talking to, um, uh, um, actually answering the question. Do you believe that it is a place like the Elysian fields of the Asians, where all the good spirits are conf conf confusedly crowded together without any other concern than that of enjoying an eternity of passive bliss? Don't we love when we get a question for an answer? <laughs> it makes us think, right? And that's what they're trying to do. It makes, you know, trying to, um, makes us think, think. No, it is universal space, the planets, the stars, and all the highly evolved worlds on which spirits enjoy all their fac faculties without the tribulations of material life or the anguish inherent to less evolved stages. Where is this place? Because we don't see it here on Earth. <laughs> Where is this? Because we're not, it, it, with the little understanding that we have of spiritism, we're not highly evolved individuals. Morally or, well, we have made some invest, advancement intellectually, but there's much more to conquer, to learn. So, again, highly evolved worlds. We have a glimpse of what the spirits can bring to us and say what we will see, but there's a lot that we have to conquer to get to this place. Or, as we will see later on, to make the world, planet Earth, to become one of these places, since we're in a, tr in a transition. So it is, it is a pathway that we have to take for, really, for us to change this perception, number one, to face the facts, number two, Right, that we are seeing our, in our to get to this place, to make the place a better place, uh, to, to make the earth a better place to live. Here it is, an example of what we're talking about here. Two uh, amazing books, and we can mention all of them and make a, a, a uh, bring examples of this idea of heaven and hell. Number one, the first book of the um, Andrea Luis series. Uh, psychographed by Chico Xavier, Nosolar, first chapter. André Luis himself is describing what he went through in the umbral or the lower zones, right? Right after discarnating, right after losing the physical body. If we read, it's hell. It's really dark. It's really, it, it really, if you, if you have read the book and if you have analyzed the words deeply, it makes you wonder if you want to give a, that book to somebody who is suffering, who is in a troubled condition. Obviously, we will all, all make that recommendation. It's always good to give the gospel court to spiritism, something more uplifting for the person to analyze and to read. This is more a book that, yes, it will help an individual later down the road as they you know, gain some understanding about spiritism and what he was going through as well. But it's hell. It's the first chapter. It staples right there what we go through in our lives if we are not living according to the natural laws. And he describes that, you know, when, whenever one of the, the words, I'm trying to paraphrase here, is that whenever the silence um, didn't take him over, the screams, the yells, and everything that, you know, all the, the monsters, the uh, um, things that was happening there, then took him over. So it was, the silence was bad, but also, the, all the noise was, you know, even worse. So nothing was quite well. Because sometimes we want to have peace and say, okay, no, this is, now you have peace, this is my heaven, right? But to him, not, not even that was good. Not even that silence that sometimes we want to have, it was good. Everything was scary. And Kirsten, a couple weeks ago, brought the, this other book, the 10th book of the series, Action and Reaction, 
when they describe uh, Monsoon Pies or Peace Mansion, which is a colony under the jurisdiction of Nosolor as well, this other um, colony, situated in the lower zones, then things are getting worse. Because when we read Nosolor, not only we get that first chapter that really incites us, oh my God, this is hell, this is really bad, but also it shows a different world, which is the Nosolor after the rescue, where he goes and what he sees. The places, the, all the nice locations and the different ministries that we were like, wow, I want to go to this place. I want to go to a colony like this. Or sometimes we think that that's the only colony, that's the only beautiful colony that we, but there are many, 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 many others, perhaps uh, more evolved than Nosolor, or as we see right here, Manson Pais, a colony under the jurisdiction of Nosolor, situated in the lower zone, Institute of Readjustment, located in the regions, punished by a hostile natural environment. Dedicated to receiving unfortunate or infirm spirits, patients here can be admitted to more advanced colonies in the higher realms or return to the human sphere. On, on, to be precise, if we have the book or not, or if you're planning to buy the book, I just would like to share a couple words here that he says that he brings to us. Situated in the lower zones, the institute was similar to St. Bernard's Monastery in that it was located in a region punished by a hostile natural environment. The difference was that the almost constant snowfall around the famous monastery on the slopes between Switzerland and Italy was replaced around the institute by thick darkness, which at the moment had become even heavier and more dreadful as if whipped by an incent gale. gale. And then he goes on, um, you know, making several observations that the, a raging uh, windstorm carrying a dark substance similar to airborne dirt whirled violently in a strange vortex like a dark water, water spout. This is Andre Luis's um, uh, words about this location where they were. And that they are, what are they doing there? If anybody remembers what Kirsten brought to us. What was Andrea Luis doing there? What was Eladio doing there? Let's go back to find out here. Druzel is the mentor in the story, the mentor and director and head of mentor director and head of Manson Pais. The spirit that it kind of guides the work, what is being done there. Eladio, companion of Andrea Luis from Nostalar, he also came to study with Andrea Luis, the law of cause and effect. Andrea Luis, spiritual student from Nostra Lara, visiting Monson to stu study with a lot of the law and cause and effect. And then the assistant, um, part of director's team. So here it is. Andrea Luis and Eladio are going to do an internship, as we just described, the dark place in hell. <laughs> in hell. Can you imagine? It's just like going to, for those who doesn't, who doesn't like blood, going to the medical school and what they're going to face. People being cut, suffering. But that's what they wanted to do. That's, that's how they will be able to ascend to a higher place, understanding what this, um, uh, the law of cause effect is. Based on what the individuals who are there now, not forever, but at least temporarily, trying to understand what they have done, what they came from, and what they need to do now to replace or redo or whatever, make amendments um, in the future life in their future step that they have to take. But we see here the different poles, the hell and the heaven, for someone to dedicate their time to the suffering of others. And they're on, I believe on chapter two or three, it gets even better. Because they, they say that there is an attack. And uh, on, on the things that, they, that, that Andre Luis described, um, that what was going on, a true war um, that was going on at the time, and how they protect themselves. And they, they describe the faces of the spirits around it. And that's what they're doing there. They're learning. They're trying to help others. And they're beautiful cases. That's not just the book. But we're trying to excite here or to, un or to help understand that perhaps in these difficult m moments of our lives, there is also a work for us to do. Right? And we'll see a little bit more of this. Just as the lady uh, referring to the war, referring to her stay in the Afghanistan, and then we go back to the purgatory. 
In the belief of Roman Catholics and others, a condition or place in which the souls of those dying penitent are purified from venial sins or undergo the temporal punishment that, after the guilt or mortal sin has been remitted, it still remains to be endured by the sinner. Number two, any condition or place of temporary punishment, suffering, expi expiation, or anything that is like. Now, how many, how many times we see ourselves going through this process of temporary punishment or expiating or something or suffering about something that we have just, um, something that we have done wrong? This right here, we can say, put right down here, earth. <laughs> earth. That is earth. And that's exactly what the Spirit tells us on question um, 1013 of the Spirit's book. What is to be understood of purgatory? What is it? Physical and mental suffering. Suffering. It is a period of expiation. It is almost always on the earth that you make your own purgatory, and that is where God makes you expiate your wrongs. What is called purgatory is also a symbol that should not be understood as some defined the finite uh, place, but rather the state of imperfect spirits who are in expiation until their complete purification raises them to the plane of blissful spirit. Since this purification occurs over several incarnations, purgatory consists in the trials of corporeal life. We go to school as we are not in the physical body, preparing ourselves, right, studying, uh, taking the lessons, and then we reincarnate Right, ready for, you know, to take that test, take that assessment, and most of the time, what would happen? The distractions of life puts us down, and we are here wasting time, wasting time. And then we go back again. We go back. To, oh, can I have another chance? Please have another chance. And then you go to school again, and then you try it again. And then again, all the problems that we know and we see over time, we as we can see here in the literature. And again, not punishing ourselves or making ourselves you know, feel bad about it, pretty much ourselves. If we can exemplify who are these individuals, we are. We are these individuals who are going through this. We're going to take a turn now to, we've been talking about the Spirit's book, but on something that is quite interesting for us to analyze. This is on, on the book Heaven and Hell, which we'll talk a little bit more, more about it um, on chapter 4, that Kardec also explains that purgatory, when thus explained, in this idea that we are in this moment of expiating, analyzing what we're going through, making amendments, right, is no longer vague and un uncertain hypothesis. It is a physical reality. Oh, going back to our reality now, because we can see it, we can feel it. It's a physical reality which we see and touch and to which we are, even now, subjected where purgatory is nothing else than the worlds of expiation and the earth, as yet, is one of those worlds, worlds in which men expiate their past and their uh, present for the advancement of their future, future happiness. But contrary to the idea usually entertained in regard to purgatory, each man can abridge or prolong his stay in it at self-improvement, and he comes out of it not because he has finished his time or through the merits of somebody else, but as the reward of his own individual merits in virtue of the principle set forth in the declaration of, of Christ to each according to his works, a declaration which sums up the entire code of divine justice. Right here, there's a lot of information that we will take little by little as we develop the other um, uh, slides. But it's very important, and we ask everyone to take a look the first part of the, of the, um, of the book, Heaven, Heaven and Hell, and as we have time as well, which I believe everybody will, to read the entire thing and read the second part as well. This in amazing book, and we'll go back to this, just so we can make a parallel here. This amazing book, the fourth work of the five main books of the Spirit's literature, was published in 1865. We have it here. Right over here. A total of 19 chapters divided in two parts. The first part, we'll talk about the doctrine. And we'll talk about heaven, hell, purgatory, the limbo, as we mentioned earlier today. Right? 
the future punishment, right? Eternal punishment. All these things that we have been carrying, we have been taught over and over and over again. And our feeling of guilt keeps carrying us, dragging us down and not letting us send to a better place. And not only helping, let us help the environment as well as we we're talking about, you know, different, um, a different world that we are awaiting for. On the first part, the 11 chapters, we'll see future life in, um, in annihilation, fear of death, heaven, hell, purgatory, the doctrine of um, eternal punishment, as we say, um, spirits of view on the future punishment, angels, demons, um, intervention of demons in the spirit, the prohibition to evoke the dead. It answers several questions that perhaps we have about these topics. So we truly um, invite everyone just to take a look at it. And the second part of it, in, in as we would like to say here, this is truly, truly a gift from God to have this chapter composed by uh, Colin Kardec and the spirits who present themselves or give themselves an example of what happens after life in the corporeal, um, in, our, in the body. The passage, how it works, the happy spirits, spirit in the middling um, condition, suffering spirits, suicides, repentant criminals, obituary ob uh, spirits, and terrestrial expiation as well. It's, it's just a blessing when you take some of these examples and you read and you're like, wow, what is to be really happy after the passage? What is to suffer? What kind of suffering we, we, we can consider after um, we take away our lives? Not just really taking away our lives as we see sometimes happening, but just perhaps as Andrea Luis and Oslar, that to him was a social drinker, someone who didn't take life as seriously as we are invited to do so, and he thought he was doing the right thing. Lack of understanding, we, under we, we can say yes, it explains, but it, just, it doesn't justify. And the same thing with sometimes with our ego, we're like, oh, it's okay. You know, we're, we just, we're still, you know, not mature yet, and we're wasting time. But the truth of the matter is, we have the science right next to us to really invite us to um, do something different. Um, but here it is. But as we go back to the other slide, that let me just go back here and make a, analyze this together. There are several things that we can analyze here, but there are a couple, couple that, are, that we would like to highlight. That number one, the suffering that we are going through, this purgatory that we are facing in our lives is not eternal. It's not forever. And we'll see more information if we go back to the, um, um, the book that we just mentioned, Heaven and Hell, as we, the, from the place where we extracted this, it's not forever. It would depend on what? On somebody else? Will somebody, can somebody else come to me and wash, excuse the way we say right now, our sins, right? Can somebody pay for what I have done wrong? Is it, is it correct? If we were to ask a mother and say, would you um, put your life at risk to save your, your baby? The mother will probably say yes. The mother will give their life or the father or whoever is entitled to say that is responsible for a little being or someone that they love, yeah, I would do that because of the love. Not necessarily will wash away the sins or will free that person from the wrongdoings that they have been doing. We may come and give our hands and say, let's go. Let's go ahead and take a different um, approach here or do something wrong because what we're doing is not right. But not necessarily we can be responsible for others' wrongdoing. As well as the... the the, as they bring here this calling from Christ to each according to his own works. So no matter what we can say, no matter how much we can cry about it, we have to work. We have to go to work. We have to really um, put forth what? We also brought this extra, um, 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 part of the... Um, it's it's called I forget now the 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 pino the the the, the way how God's um, um, laws work when it comes down to the 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 the, 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 w the way we have to pay uh, for the problems that we create. Every imperfection of the soul produces its own inevitable share of suffering. So 
for an action, a bad action, will then have a bad consequence, action and reaction. And every good quality produced, in every good quality produced in virtue of the same law, of, sa of the same law, its own natural certain share of happiness, action and reaction. If, I'm, if my action is of benevolence, or benevolence or, or happiness towards somebody, of love, of charity, this is what I'm going to get back. And this is, this, is, this is what I will feel no matter the environment, no matter what others are thinking, no matter what others are, what others are feeling, um, feeling as well. Because we tend to see or tend to generalize or to make this, um, um, this connection of you know, a beautiful place, being a place where everybody's laughing, everybody's smiling. Where we go to work, we expect everybody to be happy. Somebody doesn't say a word that day, not feeling well. Oh my God, that person is really not corresponding to my happiness. So then you start feeling shaky again. When that feeling should be really inside of you and the external should not take um, you by the hand and take you someplace else. But how is this? How can this be done right here? Every imperfection of the soul produces its own inevitable, inevitable share of suffering. So if I'm doing something wrong in my life, it's just by chance that the other person then is trying, they're succeeding, they're doing something. Are they better? Are they the chosen ones? Are they the you know, the, the, the happy people that, is, that I can never get there? Why is that happening? How can others do right when I can only do wrong? How can others succeed on their task when I can only try? Let's put it that way. Because at least we, can, we would like to say that we are trying. Here's an answer for us, something for us to analyze. Where is the law of God written? In the conscience. It's very easy because we see this over and over and again. And sometimes it's hard because we read the last statement. It's like, oh, this person, you know, it's easy for them. The grass is greener on the other side. And it is in the conscience. And what are the laws? Right here. We have a series um, on, of talks on, on this matter, talking about the natural laws. Law of worship, law of work, reproduction, preservation, progress, liber liberty, and, and the other ones too. To finalize, obviously, we can never forget the justice, love, and compassion that encompasses com all these laws. And it's a beautiful thing because... They're inside of us. It's not only inside of my neighbor. It's not only inside of my co-worker or someone who is really um, an example, Mother Teresa or Gandhi. It's, ins it's inside of us. If we don't put to work, we're done. Doing what? We're going against it. And what happens? We suffer. It's that circle of love that we can call and say, okay, you know, you're there, you're inside, you're, you know, playing by the rules, you're doing everything that you can, you're being tolerant and all, but once you step outside, which is okay, because again, we're still harvesting this, this, this beautiful ground to one day see the, 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 the flowers blooming, but it's interesting that sometimes we get out of it and we suffer and it pulls us right back to that um, correspondency to these laws or to analyze our thoughts better or our feelings better. So it's really interesting that we always remind of ourselves the essence is inside of us. So whatever I do, it will, I will receive a token the same way. I will receive, and I will have to make amendments. Just for us to have a better picture of this, when we look at the different orders of spirits from the spirits book, when we look at the first order, it seems kind of weird because, it, you know, from top to bottom, but it really makes also us wonder, you know, that how divine these spirits are, you know, helping us without asking for anything. And when we look at these or this order, the third order, the second order, and the first order, were they created this way? No. They had to harvest again. They have to really go um, uh, to fight all their, their, their bad tendencies to get to this point. To become a Christ, um, he didn't just snap his finger and say, okay, now I'm going to be Christ. He went through all the different reincarnations, as we have read here, to get to this point. To look at earth with all the suffering and say, that is my work. And until that doesn't become, quote, unquote, a heaven where everybody's happy, 
I'm not happy. You know, whether it's hell for some people, they're here working with us. They're here trying. And that's the, the pure spirit. It takes us, it gives us a different explanation when we think that when we get to this point, we'll be sitting at the beach doing nothing and really drinking, you know, just cold drinks and having fun. No, they're working. Because their bliss, their heaven, their happiness is to help others, is the happiness of others. And it's a beautiful thing because it really liberates us from the, our insecurities and our troubles because we know that we're not alone. We know that we're not alone. God is not alone doing his work. He has the help of all these beautiful um, beings that have mastered what we just mentioned. And it was Jesus, since we just mentioned, that also said the words, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There are many dwellings in my Father's house. If it were not so, I would, not, not, I would have told you, for I am to going to prepare the place. And after I have gone and have prepared the place for you, I will return and you will take, and I will take you with me, so that there where I am, you will be baby also. The second thing that kind of, in a way, contradicts what we, we just mentioned as far as Jesus being here helping us, when he said, my kingdom is not of this world, and we can see explanation of these two passages in the Gospel according to Spiritism, chapter 3, and then the second one in chapter uh, 2, explaining, ex giving a beautiful explanation of what Jesus really meant when he said these things, that he was going to prepare a place for us, that he was going to be with us, on, 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 on our endeavors, on, on, on how we obviously present and how we uh, conduct ourselves. But then he comes and says, my kingdom is not this world. Is it contradicting? The time that when he said that, and we can apply for many instances of our lives, is that what we are living in our lives right now is not part of his kingdom. But he understands. He understands because it's part of evolution. It's part of who we are right now, trying to bring out all the materialistic ideas, right? All the instincts that we bring from the, from the past and harvest new things, harvest love, charity, and all the, the virtues that we need to harvest in our hearts and to develop within ourselves. Some of us have mastered some virtues that if I look at it and say, wow, uh, I'm, that's pretty tough. I wish I was that concise with my act or, or I was doing good in that area. But some others, I can say, you know what? I can be a little bit more patient, I wish. I can be a little bit more uh, tolerant. Or I can be, um, I don't have to um, exalt myself in front of others. Things like that, that sometimes we see these traits, these virtues in other people, and we say, wow, this is really interesting. You know, I wish I could be some th that way too. At least we have a glim glimpse sometimes that kind of will, you know, co come back to us later on. But this, uh, this beautiful mind that govern this, this, th the planet Earth, have told us, the place is prepared for you. This is not my time, my place right now, but I'll be here to help you develop this. So Jesus not only is calling our attention to what it is to the true heaven, to what is the, the, the true hell that we go through in the purgatory, but saying, let's go to work. Let's change this. And we see this right here on the explanations that we get in the Gospel according to Spiritism about the primitive world, the world of tests and atonement, regenerating, regenerating worlds, the blessed world and celestial and divine worlds. Pretty much the, the, the houses of those spirit order, the, the spirits that are in different orders to live. We can take, a, for example, a celestial or divine uh, mind um, to be in a primitive world, unless if it was for a mission to guide, to help. The same thing if we go back now from a world of tests and atonement to a primitive world, we'll be suffering. We'll be like, well, you know what? We need to do some cleaning here. Imagine if we go back now, if we had the opportunity to go and like the scientific, you know, the, the science movies that we see and say, you know what? Let's go ahead and take a trip back there now. What would we do? First of all, we would be mad because <laughs> we would have no technology whatsoever. But then you would incite what? The development. 
things that we already know, we would be able to help those individuals who are not well developed. And that is the work of what? Those who have accomplished something, that they come back to us and they help us. We are in this transition right now from a world of testament atonement to a regenerating world. But in order for us to fully, to be complete at this level, we need to change ourselves because it's not that the earth is changing by itself. There are some changes, physical changes that are happening as we know, but we have to change. And as we change, then the world will also will correspond. And the spirits who will be reincarnated here will be more enlightening. They will be then be able to see that we are well prepared to receive new teachings, right? To see less suffering because we will stop those suffering ourselves and will be more open to their teachings um, and pretty much open for less suffering. But it's a, just a beautiful way to see where, where are we on this whole thing and what can I do to correspond to this change? How can I put my hands, you know, to help? What can I do? In this transition, here's a beautiful question. What are the steps to the regeneration? Because now we, we have an idea where, okay, we're not in heaven, we're not in hell, we're pretty much in this beautiful purgatory that we're, you know, um, um, stepping over stones and we're falling and we're getting up and we're um, making amendments, we're trying to correct ourselves, hoping that as we correct ourselves, we correct others as well, their behaviors, inviting them by a good be behavior to do the same thing. But the fact of the matter is we have done something wrong and we have to make amendments if not in this, in this life, based on our sufferings, because the suffering, as we will see, and here it is, the pinnacle of life to come, chapter 7 of, this, of the first part of the, the book, Heaven and Hell, we'll see that nothing is forever. The suffering is not forever, as we mentioned. But also, it will depend on how we analyze it, how we see it. And guilt, please, no more. <laughs> we have to face it. How hard is to face, right, a problem when we create a problem? To say, you know what, I've committed an error. I've done something wrong. We're always in denial. We never want to face it because we know what's to come, right? We know what's to come. So let's develop this idea and prepare ourselves to this future by analyzing what we get on this beautiful passage. By the way, there are 33 items in this, in this, um, in this chapter I'm sorry, on this, on, on the penal life, penal code of life to come that talks about the suffering, talking about the, the heaven in steps that we can fully understand and prepares us you know, in a beautiful way. But repentance is the first step towards reformation. But repent, repentance alone is not sufficient to deliver the wrongdoer from the consequences of his wrongdoing. To affect this result, expiation and reparation are also necessary. We just said it. We're, most of the time we're in denial of this step, the repentance, right? Because we can say, okay, now um, as, as the, the church has, has played out there that, okay, you know what? I've done something small. Not necessarily I'll go to hell. Um, I'll go to the purgatory. And then I say, I'm, you know, I repent. You know, I did something wrong. Now I'll go to heaven. That would be kind of absurd. And what about for those now that we understand that there is no eternal punishment, there is no eternal hell, when they do something really wrong, and then they just say, okay, I repent. I'm fine. You know what? I done something wrong. Okay, go to heaven. Is it like that? Is that really the, the law of cause and effect? Or the action reaction, as we have seen here with Kirsten, we can see in the book as well as we analyze the different lives, why we're suffering sometimes, right? There's these two steps that we have to take as well, the expiation and reparation. So repentance is this moment in which we find ourselves and say, you know what, I have done something wrong. I admit, and I would like, I would love to have that second chance, or perhaps the third chance, or the fourth chance, because we don't know if we will, in fact, succeed. We could error again. Not that we should, but it's human to, to error. Repentance, expiation, reparation are the three conditions necessary for the effacing or facing of a fault and the suppression of its consequences. 
the problem that we create in somebody's life or in our lives cannot be changed. What has been done, has been done. If the act is great, so will be the suffering. The same way if when we, um, uh, as, as we were seeing here, for someone, for someone who has an illness, right, they will suffer more or perhaps just, just will suffer more than someone who doesn't have an illness. If somebody has one, two, or three virtues, they will also feel good about themselves based on the number of virtues that they have accomplished. If we have many wrongdoings or many vices, we'll suffer correspondingly to the number of vices that we have. It's a simple thing. It's a simple way to analyze and very enlightening. Because we think that, you know what? Gosh, I'm going to leave this, this suffering for the rest of my life. I'm going to have to face this person, that person, and we'll, I'm never going to get out of this. But here is the, the step to this regeneration. For us to look at and say, okay, why do I suffer? Why do I come in, con when I come in contact with this person, with this situation, or this matter, that fire burns inside of me like that hell that sometimes we like to portray, right? And we have to analyze we can't be in denial anymore. And then we expiate, analyzing the whole thing and say, okay, now I'm preparing myself to the moment in which I will have to repair. I'll have to go back again, perhaps with that person or with that situation and make amendments, do something different. Not necessarily, it's not the, the law that is an eye for an eye. It doesn't have to be that way. And we talked about this before that Perhaps when I do something wrong or towards somebody, ha I have to go back to that person. God will give us the appropriate time, perhaps, to face that person. But it, it could be a family member that we can go and say, you know what? I've done this to this person, right? And now I want to do it right at this time. And it's the exercise that we take that perhaps one day we'll be able to see face that person. And perhaps if we meet one day, we'll be able to know what? You have made some grounds here. So... It's just a beautiful thing. And then the, 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 the last part of this item, um, it says repentance mitigates the suffering of expiation because it opens the door to hope and paves the way to rehabilitation. But it's only reparation that by destroying the cause of our suffering can annul the suffering which it is, which its fact, the granting of a free pardon to the wrongdoer would be merely the granting of a favor and not an annulling of the cause and consequences of his wrongdoing. So the act is not the wrongdoing. The, the, the act is not the, the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is inside of us. So we should really what? Put that out. Leave that behind. By changing our thoughts, by changing our, 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 our feelings, and by doing it right, then we can truly prove to ourselves, not to somebody else, because we're not, we don't want to do the, the right things or, or to help others, exalting ourselves, but to say, you know what, this I have conquered, this I have changed. And then, hopefully, like we said, um, that will also help others, and perhaps that person who have you, that you have wronged uh, before. But this is, again, just a, um, a way for us to call our attention to change our ways of thinking about life. When we go and say, oh my God, my life is hell, my situation is worse, or uh, that person is going through hell. Uh, because sometimes we tend to look at people and criticize them and, and give a connotation to their, what they're going through. And the same way that, okay, I want to go to heaven, I want to prepare myself to the eternal life where everything's beautiful, everybody's waiting for me. No, it, things... You know, through, through Spiritism, we see that things are much more than that. And we would like to finalize with this little story that we recently heard um, a speaker um, in Brazil saying. Um, it's a, um, a passage from this book called The Medi um, Mediumistic Anthology of Christmas. There are several messages about Christmas, several messages about um, this idea of Christmas, the, 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 the coming of the Christ to earth, uh, is by Brother Axel, as many of you know, Ambassador the Campus, chapter 61. The, the name of the title of the, um, 
of the passage called the Apostles' Christmas, or Natal do Apostolo. Mainly, it's the moment that Peter is called to truly serve and be quiet, and he was actually taken in a prison to um, to be killed. And it's really interesting that um, Brother Acts brings this 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 passage, and th he describes in a beautiful way the moment uh, that he's taken then to to be sacrificed, or whichever way we want to put it, in a nice way. But he describes that as the moment took place that Peter then, knowing what was going through, start analyzing the, everything that was going around. And he describes the scene as well. We didn't want to bring any picture of, you know, truly what it portrays. But this beautiful cartoon here just so us to take it easily and nicely and to truly analyze the, the meaning of the story where he was about around, uh, he's 80, when he's 80. Uh, and we can picture someone who is 80 years old, very fragile, tired, and all those things. And he was, again, taken uh, to be sacrificed, to be killed. And he had that feeling inside of him that, you know what, um, maybe the good news um, need more really stronger people, new individuals or younger individuals to really bring the word of, cr the, of, of Christ um, but he had that feeling inside of him as well. Wow, man, I so miss my, you know, the, 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 uh, the master. I so miss the Jesus um, when he was around. And he started connecting with those feelings. And he could then gaze the people crying around, you know, the people that who have he, he helped. And all of those individuals who um, he had done something to them and everybody was crying. It was that, you know, nostalgic feeling as well. And even the people who didn't like him, also, they were there, and they're like, "Oh, this is a human being. How can they be doing such, uh, you know, such a thing to him?" And, but anyways, he was being taken um, to be killed. There was one individual, um, what they call a Petroian, um, Petroian, uh, which was like um, a a guard, um, as of the time, um, called Sertonio Aniceto, who was really inciting, you know, making the the matter really worse, um, calling him names, doing all kinds of things, you know, saying, calling him witch, and you can name it, um, you know, at the time. And he continued just going and saying, you know, this is the time, you know, this is my time to serve and to really um, have faith on what I have done and what I will go through. And the, the, the gentleman, um, Aniceto, then continues, you know, saying all the, the bad things to him, but he gazes, you know, the horizon. And he kind of, Umberto de Campos is very poetic and brings that scene to all of us. And he obviously gets to be killed by this, this guard, by this um, petroleum. petroleum. Um, and, and as he goes through that moment of the passage that he's feeling the blood and all those things, he then gazes, you know, to the horizon and sees Jesus coming. Jesus then comes and says, okay, come with me. And they soon they go. And time goes by um, as, they, as Jesus then, as we saw here, truly prepares a place for him to be. And Peter, throughout time, uh, through some time, then goes to the higher zone, to a higher um, elevations, and he learns new things. He rehabilitates himself. And Jesus one day comes to him and say, okay, now it's time for us to depart again. And I need to um, leave. And Peter looks, okay, what's, gonna ha what's happening now? Again, I'm you know, losing you again after I lost you on earth. And you came to me and we're going to lose again. And he said, yes, I have to go back to earth. Until, and Jesus then pre um, um, presents the idea, that until there is moaning on earth, I will not be happy. I will not, you know, um, um, let's call, take a vacation, you know, or, 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 or rest. And Peter then looks at him and say, okay, if you go, I'll go too. And Jesus had already told him, you know, now you go. I mean, go study, go do whatever you have to do. Um, I'll, I'll go back to earth. I'll do the dirty job, whatever I have to do. But say, you know what? I want to do it too. I want to be there with you. And they come back. And as they go through the same location at the time, the, 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 as, as Umberto de Campo mentions, the, the Rome, and, in Rome, and they go through you know, um, the, the streets, they hear people crying, and some of them were actually happy 
that they had the good news, they had the teachings of, of Christ with them, and they start helping people. And as they're analyzing the whole thing, then Jesus turns to, to Peter and says, Peter, somebody's looking for you. And then Peter turn, turns and he sees Aniceto, the man who killed him with his son, sick. And as uh, the way uh, um, Umberto de Campo described the story is that Aniceto could feel that he was around, that Peter was around. And through the mind, he describes that he was connecting with Peter and begging for Peter to come and help the sick child, his son. And obviously, pre Peter didn't hesitate and goes back and heals the kid, as well giving them, giving Aniceto some comfort. And then the kid starts, you know, feeling better again. And the, 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 the man starts um, singing for what he had received. And the storage pretty much finalizes right then and there by Roberto de Campos saying, for Peter, his life was just a continuation. It was just a normal day for him. For the man, for Aniceto, was a new beginning. Because he truly, at that moment of suffering, was able to see, um, uh, to receive the help. And with this story, why we're closing with this story? Because here it is, the master coming back to the harsh times, to the difficulties of the moment. Peter, someone who had just left, right? The insanity of the world goes back, faces who? The man who took his life, right? In a really disaster way, we didn't say the whole thing, but in a really disaster way, but he went back and helped that same person who took his life. Not directly, he was helping the kid, but indirectly because if you're, having, if you're helping the son of somebody, you're helping that person. And we see then what is hell? What is heaven, right? What do we have to do in order for us to really ascend to a better place. And perhaps on, when the day comes that we can ascend to that better place, do we really want to go? Knowing that perhaps those behind could be a son, a daughter, husband, or wife. And we see these examples in life. We many, not only Peter here, um, but Brizero de Menezes, for example, he was, after he discarnated in his last incarnation, he was able to ascend to a better place. What did he do? He has to stay. It's just an amazing thing. Because sometimes we are so little, sometimes we are so uh, worried about our problems that we forget about the rest. We forget about the true essence, the true teachings that uh, Jesus has, taught, uh, has brought to us. That the teachings that uh, of the examples that we see these great minds uh, working in Oslar in the different chambers, um, working at Manson Pais and dedicating their lives, and many others, when they have to come from a beautiful place to earth to say, okay, now we have to go and help that family, to go and help that little one, right? And we are just completely lost. We go back, we go back to our normal life tomorrow, getting up in the morning, okay, I have to work today, I have to come back home, I have to do this and this and that, and we forget the essence. We forget what we're going up to and we get caught up on the purgatory or perhaps the hell of our lives. So we invite everyone then to, if you wish, I uh, can certainly send not only this message, but also the book. It unfortunately isn't in Portuguese, but the other passage that we mentioned as well, um, invite everyone to really liberate ourselves with these, of these connotations, if we will, or perhaps the understanding that we, we bring uh, with ourselves from the past and feel better, really feel better that perhaps when we're facing our hell, to say, okay, it's fine, but I will get out of this. I will um, um, become a better being in the midst of our suffering. So if anybody have any questions, any highlights, anything that you would like to mention, we open for about five minutes before we invite um, the little ones for the passes as well. Any questions, concern, comments? I think you put well that uh, is uh, everything seems so relative, and everything seems so individual. What may be hell to me, it can be seen by others as something blessing. Uh, but I feel that when we have uh, some intolerance for something, 
fear or panic or prejudice, those are our help because uh, sooner or later we will be faced face to face. <laughs> we, have, we are put in a situation to face those prejudices that uh, we, I developed. Like I just imagine <laughs> like after I die, if I was uh, very against certain type, certain race, for instance. And I picture me in a waiting room where everybody's there is of that race that I don't like it. And if I'm feeling bad, a sick, uncomfortable, only person that will able to help me that is around is from that race. So either I die once more or more and go deep down, or I have to change myself to be happy uh, around that situation, around those people. The same thing that I didn't do yet well is I imagine insects that I have some fear. You know, it would be nicer if I didn't have this fear that even if I see them there, I will feel like empathetic or, you know, dog or cat or whatever. So it's all what is, you don't have this fear, I may have it. So it's my problem. You happier than me because you don't have this problem. Or I'm happier than you because I don't have your problem. So I think uh, it all depends on our evolution, effort to overcome this intolerance or fear or prejudices. You know, this is part, I think, of the... It is, it is a interesting because also in the, in the part that we mentioned here, the, um, the penal code of the future punishment, um, throughout those 33 items that we mentioned, that it also said if you and I, for example, and thank you for for um, your, the, your example, your thoughts, and that that if you and I, for example, are to do the same act that is not a so good act, we will suffer differently because we are different, because we process things differently, we, we think differently, we feel differently. The same way also that if we do something good, we'll feel in a different way. We'll, be, we'll feel happier in a different way, which is beautiful. It's so, so interesting. And the second point that you brought is very important as well, and I would like to bring an example about this um, that we heard from Raul, Raul uh, Teixeira. When, you know, when, we, when we analyze this idea of, the, obviously, the, your suffering is based on um, perhaps the vices that you have inside of you or that I have inside of myself. Um, one day he was watching TV and he was watching the news and he started watching all the you know, difficult things that happened in Brazil and happens throughout the world as well. And he felt very, very down. He was very, like, he was actually, you know, kind of talking back to the TV and, you know, saying bad things as well. And then Camilo, he, he's, his mentor com comes and says to him, bro, why are you so upset? Why are you so uh, negative about the whole thing? And can't you see it? He's like, can't you see? I mean, look what's going on. I mean, the, you know, the politics, this, this person doing that. And then Camilo looks at it, you know, really compassionately, we can say that way, and says, that's because you still have that inside of you. Because if we don't have those things inside of us, we don't feel that way. And then he's like, wow. <laughs> and I remember when he told this um, to us, it was just, you know, an eye opener. Because in the, perhaps we, we may go to a place and we automatically connect with that wrong one. We automatically connect with the environment because we have that inside of us. Or perhaps it's a, it's a position of guilt that we um, portray inside of us for something that we have done in the past that we haven't mastered yet with a virtue that it makes us feel bad as well because we're connecting. Because if it would, I mean, we can look at something disastrous and say, okay, what can I do to help? Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to be another person to be helped. <laughs> so it's a great example. I, we think again for the example, and it's something for us to analyze. If we feel... Um, that, oh my God, this is so hard, or when we look at somebody and the person has vices that we don't appreciate as much, you know, instead of condemn the person, let's see that 
that person also has a potential. That person also has a virtue that can be harvested, that can be learned from. So we hope then we'll stop here. We'll um, um, invite everyone then for the second pass passage of this, 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 this talk, this, this treatment as well, as we like to call, uh, for passes. And we then call Kirsten. Kirsten, if you can lead us into um, a prayer so we can prepare our, ourselves for the passes as well. So we thank you so much. If anybody has any other questions, any other comments, we can actually talk more towards the end. Thank you.